Rwanda 2020, the Ethiopian federal government and its allies uh, waged a genocidal war on the people of Tigray. Um, around 600,000 people are said to have been murdered and um, there was mass enforced displacements, destruction of infrastructure, obstruction of humanitarian aid. But one of the, um, the most highly used weapons was sexual violence. Um, women were raped, gang raped, enforcedly impregnated, enforcedly sterilized, um, and so on. This happened in front of their family members, it happened in front of their communities. It happened to the extent that some women have uh, decided to end their lives as a result. Um, many of the women in Tigray are living with all of this and without any post-rape care um, or any justice. Um, currently, there is still ongoing conflict-related sexual violence. Um, if I give you an example, if I um, was in Irob, the group that I represent, the minority that I represent, um, and I was raped. I and I, I was brave enough. Um, Her Excellency mentioned culture, and in our culture, it's deeply, deeply stigmatized to come out and say, "I have been raped." Your husband disowns you. The whole community disowns you. Um, so if that, if I was brave enough to come out and say I've been raped and walk to the nearest hospital, which is, um, if it's in Europe, like five hours walk, imagine after being raped, um, I would arrive at the hospital where it's completely destroyed, where I was there in um, in January, and there was only antibiotics in this um, hospital. I would be told by a male nurse who has had no practice on conflicts related to sexual violence that I should go to Adigrat, which is um, like a five a five hour extremely dangerous bus journey, or I could walk for twelve hours, and then if I <laughs> if I could get a three hundred and fifty bur to get to this place, um, and I this walk or whatever did not pre prevent me, I would end up in Adigrat. If I if I got to Adigrat, um, I would have to find this one stop centre. Mm -hmm. In Adigrat, I cannot speak Tigrinya. If I'm from Iraq, I'm a, from a tiny minority, and I only speak Saho, so I would only, at the maximum, be able to get, I don't know, a HIV prophylaxis. I wouldn't be able to get any psychological support or any legal aid, which I'm supposed to get at a, a one-stop center, traditionally. Um, and this is this is what's happening, like, currently, almost, like, 20, up 15 to 20 women every day are going to um, this one-stop center in Adigrat now. Two weeks ago, I was there. I was confronted by um, a 13-year-old girl who had aborted a six-month pregnancy because she was held in sexual slavery by um, Eritrean troops. So um, this is the reality for women. Um, if I wanted to seek justice, I could not. There's no, there's no existing uh, mechanisms. Um, with Ethiopia, what we tried to lobby for during the conflict was an independent investigation to the, con to the, to what's the, to the atrocities that took place. Um, ICRI was set up, the Independent Commission of Human Rights Experts on Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. There was an international um, unwillingness for this to continue. The Ethiopian government used every weapon that it could to lobby Western governments to prevent this investigation from continuing. From the investigations that did take place, crimes against humanity, uh, war crimes were found. But this is without the investigators actually going on the ground. Mm. They couldn't do that. They could only access uh, refugees and, um, and people on the phone. So um, for this woman, and so many women in Tigray, the law did not protect them. Um, yeah, so I think, <laughs> yeah, that's where we're at now. Okay. And what does your NGO do? I mean, you're, you work for an NGO, so your main aim is, if you like, um, bear witness to these appalling events, maybe in the expectation or hope that at some point it is taken up by an international tribunal or some kind of 
system to to ensure a level of justice and accountability? Is that is that your aim? Yeah. Um, so I went to Sudan during the conflict, mm -hmm. and I stayed there in the refugee camps because I could not access Tigray because it was blocked completely, and I stayed there for a year, going door to door documenting um, crimes. Um, her Excellency was mentioning how to make um, justice more accessible for survivors. Right. One of the things that we do is we um, consult victims, direct victims of these atrocity crimes, and support them to seek justice. We connect them with international human rights lawyers. We um, help them build cases and uh, seek justice. So let me ask you a sort of difficult question. You're, you're working with these people who are going through in, in an appalling political situation, and they are facing you know, atrocious social circumstances. Is a legal case against individuals going to make a difference in their life? Is, is international criminal justice going to be what brings them some improvement in their well-being, or does it just remind us why we have reason to hate people? Mm, um, I think it's a good question, and I think every time that I confront a victim, I ask them, what does justice mean to you? And I get varied answers. Um, but I think we have to understand that a lot of the victims that we uh, confront are people who don't have food to eat yeah. or um, are displaced. So. Um, in this book, there's a group of survivors called, uh, they call themselves Mona Lisa, and they're justice-seeking survivors of sexual violence. Um, they are currently, right now, in an IDP camp in Tigray. Um, there, they don't have adequate food, healthcare, or anything else. So their first objective, you'll read in the book, <laughs> is um, to return home, to be returned to Western Tigray, where they lived. And then they go on to um, accountability for the people that um, inflicted this upon them. Yeah. And when they speak about accountability, they don't go for the low-level individual soldiers. They speak about the high-level, command-level uh, perpetrators. Yeah. Because this, they understand that the crime against them was um, systemic, and it was commanded. It was told to the soldiers to do to them. Um, so, um, I don't think, I think we also have to, if we see it from the survivor's point of view, it's that, but I also think we have to see it from an impunity point of view. Like, why should these people who are inflicting this pain on these populations get away with it? <laughs> I suppose there are examples, including African examples, where that's precisely what's happened. I mean, you could say that the South African example was an example of that, that moving on, creating improvements in the well-being of people means a kind of setting aside of accountability. You're suggesting, well, I'm not quite sure, but you're, are you suggesting that that's not acceptable, that there has to be a, a holding of people to account, or do you feel that that other way, the kind of truth commission approach, the amnesty approach, is a viable possibility? Um, I think the Ethiopian government currently has a, a transitional justice policy mm -hmm. that includes the kind of stuff that you're speaking about, amnesty and uh, truth commissions mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, the example of the woman that I gave, the one woman who would have, made, be, would have been raped in Iran, yeah would have been raped by an Eritrean soldier, for example. Um, and an Eritrean, in the transitional justice policy, Eritrean crimes are not covered. covered at all. They're not mentioned at all in the whole policy. So victims of Eritrean crimes are completely neglected. And this is half of the population of Tigray. I think in an ideal sense, if truth is out, like if, if the government is able to admit what it did, if uh, the people that were involved were able to truly admit and be sorry for what they did, I, I do believe some members of the population would accept that and move on. But I do think accountability is the most important here.